great. Uh, can you see and hear me, Shipra? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. It, uh, it's my pleasure to have our next speaker now, uh, David Goldberg, who is, uh, who is uh, at Cornell ORIE, and he's going to talk about his exciting result in optimal stopping. Great, thanks, Shipra. And connections um, to RL. I didn't know that you made connections to RL already, actually. Yeah, well, there's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah. So, um, hey, everyone. So, yeah, my name's Dave. Um, and I'm uh, here to talk to you about some exciting uh, new work about uh, high dimensional control, high dimensional optimal stopping, connections to RL, and some really interesting questions in that space. Um, as a quick heads up, uh, unfortunately, I teach today, so I won't be able to make the discussion of this section, but I would love to connect to people. If you have any thoughts, et cetera, please just shoot me an email, um, and I'm happy to set up a time to chat and, and would love your feedback on this work. And this is joint with a great PhD student, Yilun Chen. So with that, let's um, let's get started. So I'm going to start. Just sure. To interrupt, hello. Uh, just to interrupt a little bit. Uh, you can speak till one ten, since we started a little late. Yeah, sure, sure. And I'll try to leave time for questions <laughs> yeah. also. Yeah, I, yeah right. I, I don't Thank teach you. till half past. So I, as long as I'm out by 20 after, I think it's okay. No, <laughs> no, I think, I think <laughs> yeah. let's do, let's do the let's 110. Let's try to keep Megan it on time. Yeah, to. yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. very good. So I'm going to start with the punchline. So optimal stopping um, is a key problem that comes up in financial math, specifically options pricing, operations research, Control, Econ CS, it already came up in uh, Suchi Chawla's talk about a uh, variance of the Pandora's box problem. It's come up in a lot of pricing problems, revenue management, et cetera. Um, so although I'm sure you know many people are, are of course familiar with some of the classical stylized independent IID models, you get one over E, these kinds of things. It turns out that um, in many real world computational problems where this, this kind of optimal stopping framework arises, um, you actually have things like full path dependence and a high dimensional process generating the information you have to use to decide whether or not to stop. So it's a very different universe than kind of these simple stylized uh, optimal stopping problems that some people might be uh, more familiar with. But in control and math finance, um, these kinds of high dimensional problems are, are very well studied and, and, and fundamental. Um, unsurprisingly, you know, and I'll, I'll talk about the model specifically a bit later, but this is considered to be kind of one of the core, simplest, non-trivial, high-dimensional uh, control problems. So of course, you have the cursor dimensionality that's kind of common knowledge. I'll be a little uh, loose with cursor dimensionality being roughly equivalent to you have too many states and no continuity or anything like this. And so I'll use these two concepts kind of synonymously. But you can't do kind of naive dynamic programming um, for that uh, reason. And again, especially after it became clear that these problems were important in mathematical finance and in spe specifically options pricing, a vast literature arose, and this, this goes back to the, you know, the 90s and, and even before that, um, about you know, how, how can we at least come up with heuristic methods or other methods to try to understand and solve, uh, at least computationally, uh, this interesting family of high dimensional uh, problems. And so there was a ton of literature on approximate dynamic programming, simulation based methods, duality methods, PDE methods. There's, there's a lot of interesting work out there. Um, and a lot of that work has had, um, you know, very interesting uh, heuristic and practical success. However, I, I think that literature does have um, some, some shortcomings. And in particular, if you want both provable computational tractability and provable error bounds, then effectively all that literature is, is, is going out the window. Um, and that's especially true for fully path dependent and high dimensional problems. But I note that, you know, really it's captured by even Markovian and high dimensional. And of course, even for the, the path dependent case, you can in principle fold that into an even nastier uh, Markov thing by just making the paths um, states. And you know, it, it was common wisdom that, well, this is a genuinely high dimensional uh, control problem. Of, of course you can't have tractability and error bounds. You know, that's, that's the common wisdom. So again, it, it for good reason, it seems theoretically intractable, and there's there's a vast literature there across many disciplines. 
Um, there's a very interesting duality literature in that space, as we'll talk about at least a little later. Um, optimal stopping can be searched, uh, can be transformed by duality into a search for a good martingale. We'll talk about that a bit later. There's a lot of literature on that, but it's effectively, a, a lot of it's very non-constructive and non-computational. And what computational literature there is, is almost always getting bounds as opposed to you know, simple computationally efficient methods for essentially the optimal dual martingale. Um, and I know the key issue here, which I'll connect to some, some topics in reinforcement learning in a moment, is that, so one might say, okay, whether it's independent or not, I can of course do some kinds of backwards induction for, you know, any reasonable control problem, optimal stopping being one of them. Um, and, you know, if I'm smart about it, I can kind of do that backwards induction by simulation on the fly, so I don't need to write down all the states. That's true. Um, however, the common wisdom, which, you know, in, is that if you take that approach, and even if you're smart about it, you still get nested conditional expectations whose depth of nesting uh, scales with the time horizon. And again, I'll later connect this to some concepts in reinforcement learning which means backwards induction, even if done cleverly, yields a runtime that scales exponentially in the time horizon. Um, and so that, that, that's, that's not uh, effective for, for solving these problems. So let me, let me kind of sneak peek the results and give, give the, the, the key takeaways. So we proved that somewhat shockingly, um, there's actually a simple and elegant formula essentially a closed form formula for this problem that was believed to be computationally intractable as a fairly elegant infinite sum. Um, and I note that as I'll talk a, a little bit about later, later terms in the sum can actually be viewed as a certain kind of higher order profit inequality for those who know what that is. I'll be clear when we talk about it. Um, but okay, infinite sum, maybe it, that's kind of a nice mathematical oddity, but maybe it's not computationally useful. Um, here, even more remarkably, we show that if you truncate that sum after k terms, you get a, a normalized error in, 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 in a fairly simple sense, which is bounded by one over k, not asymptotically, but exactly. Um, and furthermore, each term of this sum is actually easy and natural to compute by simulation, which is then going to connect to certain generative RL types of models. And when you put this together, and I'll show that sum in a few slides, you get efficient randomized epsilon uh, approximately optimal algorithms. I won't make the sense of optimality completely precise, but I'm happy to talk to people if they have questions with a computational runtime, which for any fixed error tolerance epsilon is polynomial in the time horizon and effectively independent of the dimension and totally data driven. Um, so again, for any fixed error uh, tolerance epsilon is polynomial in the time horizon and effectively independent of the dimension beating this curse of dimensionality, where I know this is really quite surprising because it was it was really thought for a very long time that this is kind of the simplest non-trivial high dimensional control problem, which couldn't possibly have kind of a simple solution like that. So that's, that's kind of interesting. We also draw a new connection to network flows, which shows that essentially the whole theory of duality for network flows, uh, I mean, duality for optimal stopping, which relates to more subtle notions of duality for uh, stochastic control more broadly and martingale methods there can actually be uh, understood more or less entirely uh, through the classical max flow min cut theory for network flows. And that actually gives a nice way to unify and reinterpret a lot of this duality literature for high dimensional optimal stopping and perhaps in some sense for just stochastic control more broadly. And I wanna stress this is a potential new hammer. We're very excited about it. And it, it could have a lot of other applications in math finance, econ CS, control OR. And I already point to one thing that I'm definitely gonna follow up with, with Suchi on is, you know, in Suchi's talk, there was discussion about if you fix the order of a Pandora's uh, box type of setup with general correlation structure, you, you get a high dimensional optimal stopping problem that, okay, they show when you have the special structure, you can get kind of a profit inequality and get a constant factor approximation with this method, you, you can essentially solve that complicated optimal stopping problem, at least for a fixed order. So that, that introduces a, already from this workshop an interesting connection. But if people have more, please let me know. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the RL connection. Just I know some of you may be a little less familiar with the literature on optimal stopping. 
So I'm going to connect this uh, to, to RL, um, which, which may make it a little more clear for, for some experts in the audience and open uh, some interesting bridges between these areas. Um, so, okay, so in, as I kind of said vaguely before, optimal stopping can be thought of as a high dimensional MDP, um, where again, high dimensional is really just a proxy for having many states, where the point is you, you have this high dimensional information. You could think about it like a bunch of economic indicators and stock values evolving in a, a, a complicated way. Um, and associated to each complicated vector, you have a single, if I stop now, what cost do I incur? And this moves around and you need to uh, decide when to stop and incur the cost for the current state, even though those high dimensional dynamics might be very complicated. When you think about it that way, it's, it's, it's clear it's just a high dimensional MDP. Um, and if I insist that you work from samples, and again, so for this talk, when I say work from samples, I mean, okay, yes, when you're solving the problem, you're on a given trajectory and need to decide when to stop. But I am assuming that you have a black box where even though this is the world, the path you're on, and this is the decision you have to make, to make that decision, you can plug in whatever states you want um, and hit a button and get a, get a, a, a trajectory there which is just reinforcement learning within the kind of generative model framework. Um, and so today's talk can be interpreted as a, a, a very interesting uh, special case of reinforcement learning in a, a generative model, generative framework. Although I do want to point out that, again, thinking about this bridge between reinforcement learning and high dimensional control, um, optimal stopping, in the optimal stopping literature, it's, it's widely understood that this problem is computationally intractable, even if you have the model and there's no learning samples or anything like that. Um, like if you could query a joint density function explicitly if there existed one, I won't dwell on that. Now it's, it's well known for much, much time now and where one of the you know, cleanest expositions on this goes, goes back at least to Sham Kakade's uh, thesis that if you're in the setting of um, reinforcement learning with a generative model, um, then the common wisdom is you can't really escape a computational complexity that's either exponential in the dimension, which again for us means roughly depends, you know, polynomially or linearly on the number of states, or you need to be exponential in the time horizon. And that's roughly for this same reason that you can always do backwards induction in some kind of naive way um, and trade off dependence on the state's uh, space for exponential dependence on the time horizon. It's, it's conceptually uh, kind of the same thing going on. And there's many works, um, great works by, by many people in the audience who are, have far more expertise in that than I, um, that there's, there's lots of interesting work on lower bounds here and the kind of fundamental computational trade-offs in reinforcement learning, um, depending on, you know, which of these things do you want to pay a price in? Um, so it, of course, an interesting question is um, are there interesting high dimensional models where you can overcome both these, where you cannot pay one of these two terrible prices? Um, and furthermore, we're gonna ask, can you do this for both sample and computational complexity? So not just maybe I know I don't need a ton of samples, but I don't know how to do the computation. We want it all. And we don't want any niceness assumptions. Where by niceness, I mean something like, you know, low rank in the sense of rank of an MDP or something mixes nicely or the costs are continuous in the state or there's some kind of linearity or things can be embedded in, in a metric space or, or something like this. So we want essentially no such kind of nice structural assumptions. Can we really tackle the high dimensionality heads on? Where again, the common wisdom is that the answer should be uh, no. But we show that yes, um, for high dimensional optimal stopping, the answer is actually yes. Um, and what, what I'm gonna do now is connect our results at a very high level to kind of an approximate dynamic programming way of thinking. Um, and in particular, the formula that I'll show you, you can think of as yielding a universally good set of basis functions where roughly the terms of the sum um, can be thought of as, as, as a certain kind of uh, very, very carefully chosen basis function. And you will use your polynomial number of samples to simulate and evaluate these, um, these basis functions. One thing I wanna point out that again, for, for, for people that may be experts in the lower bounds on these problems and say that that is, doesn't make any sense. I do note that when I talk about the runtime bounds, et cetera, 
I am not insisting that at the end of the day, we output a massive table that says for every state, would you have stopped there or not? Um, when I talk about these runtimes, it's only for the question of if you're actually solving the problem in real time and you, you haven't stopped yet, and this is the state you're at, do you stop or not? And it's, it's so these, these guarantees are for on the fly uh, decision making where I know and I'll talk a little bit more at the end. There's interesting questions about how this all connects to the landscape of RL and lower bounds there. And I'll tease uh, you know, a theme that I wanna leave people with. And again, if, if people have thoughts, I'd, I'd love to, to talk. A very big question here is what other high dimensional RL problems can we solve without making kind of niceness assumptions? Um, um, so, can I, please, yes, yeah. cool. Hi, hi there. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm just this one, the nice assumptions and versus uh, what you're doing here uh, could be considered a niceness assumption uh, of its special kind. Uh, you actually say that this is like uh, having a good set of basis functions uh, for this class of problems. So to me, uh, it, it seems difficult to a priori make a distinction between restricting the class of problems, the way you do it, just say that like it's optimal stopping, I put no other restrictions, but because it's optimal stopping, it comes with its own structure. Uh, versus if I say that, okay, I want to use linear basis functions or linear, you know, function approximation. Uh, they seem to be quite related, actually. Sure. So that's a great point. Um, and so maybe instead of niceness, uh, no niceness assumptions, I, I would say maybe no standard niceness assumptions would be, uh, or no you know, common wisdom, currently well-studied niceness assumptions, where it, indeed, I think th th there's almost certainly little hope of having such efficient methods for just general reinforcement learning or high dimensional control. And there's there's negative results out there going back to, you know, to Ciclis and others even before that. And so, yes, I guess um, here maybe a, um, this would be saying, is this teasing at maybe a new notion of niceness, which is, look, here is a well-studied family of high dimensional problems for which nobody thought that without making additional smoothness assumptions, you'd be able to solve it, but it is definitely not all of RL, et cetera. And so, yeah, that's, that's a great point. And that, that would be my quick uh, thought on that. Good. Um, okay. So moving on to the, um, model and um, problem. So I'm, I'm going to give most of the talk not in an RL kind of frame, but in kind of a just classical optimal stopping frame. But if people have questions about how it connects, I'm happy to elucidate. So we're going to be in the discrete time setting with capital T periods. I do note that if, if someone would rather think in kind of a discounted thing, then you could roughly change T for one over one minus discount factor if, if that's close to one. Um, but it's most easily thought of perhaps in the discrete time setting for the kinds of methods uh, we'll be talking about. So finite large horizon you should be thinking about. Um, we have a so-called information process, which we've written as a, a filtration. Um, but you, you don't have to think about filtration here. You can just think about, um, you have a high dimensional uh, sequence of vectors that you're seeing in an online way, y1, y2, y3, et cetera, through yt where again, um, each of the Ys is a capital D dimensional, and you think about capital D as being pretty large, say something like polynomial in the time horizon. Um, um, so it's not kind of a fixed D kind of setting. Um, and so this information is evolving over time, possibly in a non-Markovian way. If you wanted to fold it into a Markovian thinking, that wouldn't really change much about the punchline, but that's effectively the history of the Ys, the trajectory of the Ys is effectively your, your state in some um, sense. Um, we're going to talk about uh, cost functions, um, these little g sub t's, where this is the cost of stopping at time t, and that's you evaluate this uh, little g cost function on all the y's you've seen so far, and that's, you know, that's, that's this kind of classical general optimal stopping setting. I use the bracket notation for the trajectory of the y's so far. Again, each y is a capital D dimensional vector um, it could even be more abstract, but I just use this to, to um, make things concrete. I also note that the same ideas would, would in principle work in continuous time, 
Although to get an algorithmic statement, you'd have to think about what, what that would mean precisely with no extra assumptions. Um, and we don't really make any assumptions uh, here, but you, you think about it as kind of non-negative and integrable, um, even though you could kind of do away with that with one round of the method um, that I'll explain. So this is kind of the basic setup. I do know we work in the minimization setting here because um, we'll later see that actually because the max flow bin cut connection minimization is a bit more natural. Um, we let script T be the set of adapted stopping times, um, where again, an adapted stopping time is just, you know, based on the whys you've seen so far, you have to decide whether to stop or not. And the problem of interest is just pick the stopping time to minimize the expected value of, of when you stop. So uh, the technical results we do are actually very intuitive and simple, and I'm gonna present the main idea uh, quickly. Um, so, Let's denote the optimal value by this best you can do over all stopping times. There's a trivial lower bound. Of course, this is roughly the so-called profit inequality. You can't do better than how good you could do if you got to see everyone in advance. Oh, sorry, let me point out, I let ZT denote this GT evaluated on the Y so far. So it's a random variable which represents if you haven't stopped yet and you stop at time T, what's the cost you incur? So again, you have this trivial kind of profit inequality um, where you'd say, well, the best you can do is at least the expected value of the best in hindsight. That's, that's not uh, very complicated. Um, but now, incredibly, we're, that's actually half of the idea. All we're going to do is turn that into an equality using one single application of the optional stopping theorem. Let me briefly remind people the optional stopping theorem says for any martingale, the expected value of that martingale evaluated at a stopping time is just the expected value of that martingale at time one. Um, I note that, okay, there's some mild regularity conditions on the martingale, but they won't be relevant uh, for us here. So let me talk about how we're gonna use that. So what I'm gonna do is define a new process, Z2. Z2 is gonna be, I'm gonna call our original process Z1. And I'm going to define a new process Z2, which is our original process minus the dupe martingale associated with the all-time min of our original process. So it's the original process minus a martingale. And that's a very carefully chosen martingale. Namely, again, the martingale evaluated at time T is my best guess of the all-time min of my original process, given the information I have up to time T. Now, let's think about why I can, um, why this equality I have for opt up there holds. Well, suppose I do optimal stopping on my Z2 process, right? Then since for any stopping time whatsoever, when I evaluate that second term, the martingale I've subtracted off on the stopping time, its value does not depend on that specific stopping time. The fact that I've subtracted that off does not meaningfully change the optimization. It just translates it by the expected value of that martingale, which allows us just by that very simple logic, there's nothing up the sleeve there. We, we can say that the uh, optimal value is the expected value of the min of the original process plus the best I can do on this new process, my Z2 process. A key point is that because my best guess of the min given what I know now is always smaller than the value I'm looking at now, the Z2 process is actually non-negative and it's, it's stochastically below the, the original process. And of course, what am I gonna do now? I'm just gonna say, well, the Z3s, I'm gonna define Z3s as I'm just gonna bootstrap that process on the Z2s. And if I repeat that logic, I get my original optimal value is E of the min of the original process plus E of the min of this Z2 process. You can think about the Z2 process as almost like a regret process in some sense plus kind of a remaining stopping problem on um, the Z3s. And I simply keep recursing this. And I get that the original optimal value is if I keep recursing this, the expected value of the min of the Z1s plus the expected value of the min of the Z2s, et cetera, plus um, some kind of limiting remainder term. But that limiting remainder term goes to zero. And we'll actually discuss the rate explicitly. That's the whole logic. That's, that's really much of the proof. It's just the rate of convergence of that error term was proof I won't share with you is one over K, but it's actually just, just a page long proof if that. 
Um, so let me give the first few terms. The first term is just the profit, the original profit inequality, the expected value of the all-time min. The second term is, is an interesting kind of next step of that profit thinking where it's the expected value of the min of a certain kind of regret process. Now, one might think um, that this regret kind of process here might uh, degenerate and just trivialize to zero, but it does not. Um, why is that? That's because right at the start of the horizon, it's this value you're looking at minus your best guess of the min with all this stuff you haven't yet seen. Because you haven't seen it, um, that's gonna be some non-trivial thing. But at the end, it's the thing you're looking at minus the best of all the things you have seen, which is probably all the way back here. And so it's non-trivial the whole way through. And the next term is just kind of a, a, a one's more step recursed of that same logic. And again, the key theorem is that if you truncate that sum after k terms and your original process was bounded, so the only uh, assumption we have whatsoever is that your rewards are bounded, um, the, the error is just one over k, which yields, um, if you truncate after k terms, and that essentially yields all our algorithms. Although we do prove other bounds under slightly stronger assumptions if you have no upper bound on your rewards process, et cetera. And we note for, for our method, this is tight in the worst case, um, but it seems to converge much faster for many examples. And we are working on other types of expansions that maybe would be even faster. So let me just briefly talk about the algorithmic implications. So again, you know, if you just look at this slide, it's, it's kind of intuitively clear that to compute the kth term here, you just need kind of depth k nested access to your simulator, which is really just depth k nested simulations that you can do just with the regular simulator. Um, and there's no curse of dimensionality. The dimensionality only arises in your need to simulate trajectories of the original process, which, you know, whether that can be overcome or not is not, is not clear. Again, it's completely data-driven. Um, it's all based on simulation in, in the same sense of like a degenerative kind of RL model. Um, and although the complexity increases as you need more terms, because the error is at most one over K, you only need a few terms. This yields fairly simple analysis, which yields explicit runtime bounds, depending on exactly what kind of error you want of the form for any fixed epsilon polynomial in T. Um, this is true not only for computing the value, but for actually implementing a policy. Um, so you get uh, efficient stopping strategies also. So let me talk briefly about this max flow min cut connection. So Optimal stopping says for every trajectory of your high dimensional information process, you need to pick a time T to stop. What does min cut say? Min cut says for every path from source to sync in your network, you have to pick an edge to cut. And it turns out that the whole theory of optimal stopping duality can actually be re-envisioned by mapping optimal stopping, high dimensional optimal stopping to a natural uh, uh, kind of network um, in which you've rigged it. So each path corresponds to a trajectory of your information process and the capacity of the cut is rigged to kind of correspond to the expected performance of a stopping time um, that you, you actually can express um, essentially the, the much of the theory of duality for optimal stopping and some related matters in just stochastic control using uh, max flow min cut. And this unifies a, a lot of duality results that are out there for optimal stopping and gives some simpler proofs and intuition about a lot of past results. And we note that our algorithm can actually be interpreted as a very fast randomized iterative method for solving max flow on a, on a massive tree, actually in the same spirit as what are now being called so-called quantum inspired methods. Um, and that's all I'll say about that, I think. I'll just move on. So. Let me just uh, briefly talk about some interesting ongoing work. Um, so we're working on kind of a fast implementation um, that could actually be used in financial applications um, that kind of, you know, has combines our work with some interesting hacks and new insights to make it even faster. Um, there's a lot of interesting generalizations here, you know, just to give one example already, uh, the Pandora's box problem from Suchi's talk. There's extensions, uh, some of them are more, more kind of uh, clear. There's you know, multiple stopping for, for example, pricing swing options. There's dynamic pricing. Um, 
we have some interesting uh, work that we're, we're working on completing on online combinatorial optimization with unstructured high dimensional covariates, um, you know, revenue management, uh, some interesting questions in, in the computation of Gittins indices, sequential statistics and change point detection. Again, as I said, our expansion can be roughly interpreted as kind of a higher order refinement to the classical profit inequality. Um, so there's, you know, no doubt interesting connections there. Um, we do hope that, that one day these methods might actually be useful to someone. There's obviously been some very high stakes optimal stopping problems with when do we close various um, entities during this terrible situation we're in. Um, and again, I think a really interesting question, so I'll just jump to the, the very end, um, is as was kind of asked in a question at the very beginning, I would say, are there other notions of niceness of kind of high dimensional RL that are maybe quite different than those typically uh, appearing in the literature today, um, for which nonetheless high dimensional control and, and RL might be tractable and how does this relate to lower bounds in the literature for RL, um, especially in the generative model and the kinds of trade-offs that manifest there. All in there, again, unfortunately, I can't stick around for the discussion, but if anyone has any thoughts, I'd love to maybe quickly hear some of them now and please send me an email, I'd love to chat. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Uh, I, I, Dekin, can you start sharing your screen soon, soon while others can ask questions? Yeah, let me stop uh, sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask a quick question, maybe? Please. Um, it's very interesting talk. It's it's very very nice, and it's indeed uh, going in a different direction than all the other things that people were trying. Uh, it's really awesome. Uh, so it seems that there are multiple things going on with optimal stopping, uh, and you must have been wondering I'm in. which which of these are uh, crucial for this type of argument. Yes. Yes. Do you have some thoughts? About I do have a thought there. So the online combinatorial problem where we've been able to extend this so far is um, bipartite max weight independent set with high dimensional feature information. And why is that? That is because you can express the control problem as a massive max flow problem where you can then use certain properties of packing LPs, residual networks, et cetera, to think about solving it in some kind of ultrally parallel simulation-based way where, and this also draws a connection some between the vast literature on parallel algorithms on massive graphs and networks. And the fact that when you have a high dimensional control problem, it has a simulation structure built into it. Like generative RL, generative control, with a generative model has access to a simulator in a certain sense baked in. If you thought about a massive graph where the costs actually had possibly nasty probabilities on them in some kind of sense. And so strong connection to flows and packing LPs in some way, to what extent it can go beyond that. Also a connection to quantum inspired algorithms. As I said, this would say, I know, I don't know if anyone here is, is familiar at all with this growing work on so-called quantum inspired algorithms for various problems in TCS, which roughly say, if you give me a simulator, I can give you an algorithm. Um, and in some sense, our work can be thought of as, as a, a, a certain take on that in a certain way related to flows. And there'd be a question of when can one uh, think about methods like that for high dimensional RL and control more broadly? That would be my answer, but great question. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, I, I do have a technical question as well uh, regarding the epsilon. I, I guess I missed the, the definition of epsilon. Is it absolute error or relative error? Yeah, so the, the simplest version of the results is an additive epsilon error. Okay. Translate it is in the minimization framework, additive epsilon error when things are bounded between say zero, when the costs are bounded between zero and one, you get a completely clean result if you want to move to maximization with relative error, et cetera, at least our current results do need to throw in some kind of moment consideration or something like this. To what extent, you know, various notions of, of approximation change things, it's not clear. 
I do know that there, so there is a literature on the computational complexity of stochastic optimization, et cetera. Again, going back at least to, to John Titsiklis and Christos's uh, work there from a while ago, but I do still think because a lot of this, these models fall outside the standard Turing machine framework, there's still some very interesting questions about bridging the computational complexity question between the kind of lower bounds appearing in the RL literature and kind of absolute hardness kinds of things. I know some people are more expertise on that and are thinking about it, but I, I do think that there's still some, some great questions there. That, that, that would be my answer. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Right. Thank you, David. Uh, let's move on to the uh, third talk of the sessions. Uh, sorry for delaying.